it's not who you are. It's what you choose to do. Mm. I'm not a gym person. I just have a habit of going to the gym. I wasn't always a gym person. You know, yeah. I wasn't born a gym person. If we can change our habits to change our identity, then think about this. When you say, I'm not good enough, or I, I can't show my true self, that's not true. You haven't shown your true self in the past, but it doesn't mean you can't moving forward. You don't have to be who you always were. At any point, you can choose to change by choose to be the habits that you wish to be. Easier said than done, absolutely, but better done than said anyways. This is by Joey Joanne Season 2. I'm your host, Joanne Chan. And every Wednesday, we bring you inspiring stories, powerful message, and fun conversations with me and my special guests and friends. And it's my personal mission to empower you to live and lead a life with joy. This podcast is for you if you're looking for more joy, courage, passion, and purpose in your life. Now, let's dive into today's episode and get ready to laugh, learn, and live your life to the fullest. Our guest today is an amputee, type 1 diabetic record-holding power lifter, motivational keynote speaker, author, and disabled model who was featured on the Rock's hit TV show, Titan Games. From being humiliated and labored broken because of his disability to struggling with mental health and living in a non-disabled inclusive world, he learned to turn his obstacles into opportunities. Now using his badass bionic arm, diabetes technology to impact people around the world with the message of creating a world without limits. So guys, help me in welcoming the one and only Chris Ruden. Hi, Chris. Welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it. Thank you for having me. Yeah. So where should we start? You know, I know, you know, I would love to hear about your story, but I want to know what was the most challenging part um of hiding your because I you know I read about you, you know, your bio, I went to your website. So what was the most challenging part for you personally to hide your disability for 17 years? I think it was it was really just exhausting day in and day out to pretend to be this person that I wasn't, that I thought I had to be, because I was so afraid of what people thought of me. I was so afraid of what I thought about myself every movement was planned. You know, when I would go through a door, I'd plan on leading with my right so people wouldn't see my left arm. My entire wardrobe was about hiding my arm and hiding my hand. Every move was so calculated that it left so little room to just be happy or content or myself. You know, I really didn't figure out who I was until I was 27 years old because the rest of my life was trying to become this shell of a person that I hoped people would accept. I just couldn't believe that people would accept someone who was broken, you know, and uh, that was, it was really tough, really tough growing up. And we all have our struggles and I get that, but um, every mirror was a reminder that I wasn't enough. You know, every reflective surface was a reminder that like, oh, the, you'll never find love or you'll never find success or happiness. And that mental narrative that I have was draining, to say the least. Right. Well, I I believe so, right? I mean, that is really exhausting Um, hearing that. So what changed, you know, because what was the turning point that made you realize that, hey, I need to stop hiding. Hey, you know, I, I, I love myself. This is who I am, right? So what was the turning point for you? I wish there was like one like magical turning point and I wish I could give it to everyone. If I, if I could, I would, yeah. you know, I think... It was um, a, a slow buildup, the compound effect of just having too much. I was just fed up with that life. And it was kind of a question like, there has to be more to life than this, right? Mm. There has to be another way. There has to be something else. And uh, I remember I started speaking even while hiding my hand. I wore a glove for the majority of my life and I went on stage as speaking because I truly believed one, you teach best what you need to learn most. And two, I wanted people to see that I was trying to get better in mm. the process of being authentic and not perfect. You know, I didn't want to step on stage and be like, I'm this perfect person, you know, learn from me. It was more so like, I'm not speaking down to you. I'm speaking with you as a peer, you know? And I remember specifically I did this event for a bunch of type one diabetics. I'm also type one diabetic. And 
there was like 2000 type one diabetics there to see me speak. I spent all day with this little girl. She was probably eight or nine years old at the time. And I was getting her like hats and stuff. She had just been diagnosed with diabetes and we became like best friends. It was so cool. And uh, we're walking down this long hallway and I'll never forget, you know, I always hid my hand. She grabbed my hand, which I had a glove over at the time and was just swinging it like a kid does. And she looked at me and she was like, it's okay. You don't have to hide around me. And I was like, man, these thousand plus people are here to hear me speak. But she's the only one who actually saw me. Wow. You know, she's the only one who actually saw who I was and allowed me to be who I was. And I was like, there has to be there has to be more to life than this. And obviously, if she sees it, maybe I can see it, too. So that kind of started some of the the events that transpired after. That is beautiful. I mean, thanks for sharing that story. That's really beautiful. So how did you did you? Did you always wanted to be a speaker, you know, because, you know, then um, you have gotten all these opportunities to, to be uh, speaking on stage. So when you were going through all that difficulties, you know, in your life, what, what were you aspiring to be like? What was your dream, you know? So I think I had a lot of like pent up anger and resentment and just frustration. You know, my original dream was to be a lawyer because I loved arguing. And I realized <laughs> that's not a good reason to be a lawyer. You know, um, I... I went to school originally for exercise science because I'm stubborn and the gym was designed for two-handed people. And I'm a one-handed guy living in a two-handed world, you know? So I wanted to find a way to make it work. And I think that stubbornness turned into uh, adaptation. You know, I learned to adapt and I learned to say, maybe there's a way instead of there's not a way. I learned to be more curious instead of certain. And that really helped me a lot to go from, I can't do this because of my disability to how might I be able to do this? How could I be able to do this? You know? Um, so I did exercise science for a long time and became a personal trainer. I did, I've helped hundreds of people lose thousands of pounds. And I did so much in the fitness space because I loved it. Bodybuilding, powerlifting, breaking records. It was great. But what I found that I truly loved was the mental component. I found that I've helped people lose weight and they were still unhappy. Yeah. Even though they said, once I lost weight, I'll be happy. Once I build muscle, then I'll be happy. It's this conditional philosophy of once I have X, then I'll be happy. Yeah. And I realized we had it backwards. Once I started to find happiness within myself, then maybe I can do all these things. Maybe I can find different ways to pursue quality of life. But we were leading with the wrong thing. So while I still love fitness and I still train some people, I started speaking about mental health and topics that matter to me. And I found so much more fulfillment. I could reach so many more people. And then I just started down that path of motivational speaking to speaking about change management and disability inclusion and in general, overcoming adversity, because that's our that's like a universal language that everyone understands, regardless of your language, dialect, or geographic location. We all understand adversity. Yeah. Well, yeah. So how did so how did fitness, I would say, because you basically you love fitness and um, you know, you are strong physically, right? So how what role did fitness play in your journey towards self-acceptance and loving yourself empowerment you know because I love fitness too you know it's just like although I don't want to do it you know but I still push myself through it right so what role does it play did it play in your journey to loving yourself accepting yourself again I, I think for me I never I guess hindsight is twenty twenty. you know mm -hmm. you you never really know what you're learning while you're learning it until you look back you're like wow that taught me a lot um in the gym, I learned how to fail. And I learned that failing is okay. You know, I think one of the big lessons I learned is that failing is a verb. It's like stubbing your toe. It's it's normal. It's like making a mistake. But failure is a noun. It's an identity. You know, it's a it's a place you stay. And in the gym, it's okay to go to, you know, try and do cardio or lift weights. And at a certain point, you can't go anymore. And you're like, okay, next time I'll try harder. That process of next time I'll try harder, next time I might be able to get it, even though I didn't get it this time, maybe next time, that helped teach me the philosophy of, 
okay, if I plant one seed and it doesn't grow, I'll just plant another one. And I just keep going, keep going. And I didn't realize it at the time, but it was perseverance and resilience. It was the process of, even if it doesn't work this time, you're one step closer to the next time. So that process really played a huge role into my life. Yeah, I believe there's a saying, right? I mean, you don't, of course, we all know that we don't gain confidence to like, just, you know, you don't lose weight just by going to the gym like one time and you lose weight, right? You have to keep going. Like it's all about consistency, right? Um, so I believe that's what yeah. you're seeing as well, right? You can't fail if you keep trying, if you keep going, right? If you keep doing the things that you, you want to be good at. How do you stay mentally strong when things get tough? You know, because like you said, obstacles, you know, everyone has it, a challenge, everyone has it. So how do you, how do you overcome those challenges now that you have really have all this wisdom and knowledge? accumulated over the years. I think it's important what you said, because you you can have everything you need. You can have all the tools in the world, but if you don't use them, it's not going to help. You know, uh, there's a saying, standing in a bank won't make you rich and standing in a library doesn't mean you're studying. You know, I find myself still, if I go through hard times or a struggle, I tend to immediately go to like panic or I'm like, oh, everything is awful. Everything is terrible. And then I'm like, wait a minute. I have tools and strategies for this. So I have to actively pull myself back. It's not something that's easy all the time. You know, there are times that it's easier, but it's not like once you learn these strategies, you're just amazing at overcoming adversity anytime. No, no, we still struggle. Everyone struggles. We all have those moments, those down moments. But in those moments, it's important to remember it's temporary. It's it's manageable. And there is a way out or through whether you have to endure it or you have to find a way uh, to cr be creative and go around it, there is a way. So I think it's a reminder that, hey, this isn't permanent. It won't be like this forever. And there are different ways to get around it. You just might need to be a little bit creative. Hmm. So you mentioned about the tools and strategies. So is this uh, one of the tools and strategies? Like you just have to tell yourself, remind yourself, hey, this is not permanent, right? Um, but in the moment, like, what else can we do? You know, yeah, after telling ourselves, right, this is not permanent, but we still have to do something, right, about it to yep. overcome it, hopefully, right, the challenge or whatever. So what would you do so next? So for me, it's, yeah, strategies for me would be, um, I have this process as a triangle. You know, if you picture a triangle, and in each corner, there's a word. So we have catch, challenge on the top, and then change. So catch would be being aware of whatever feeling or process or event that is happening and talking about it with honesty. The best way I can explain that is if you get a flat tire, the honest description of the event is I have a flat tire. The dishonest event would be I have a flat tire and I suck. This is terrible. Everything is terrible. I hate my life. You, you, you lied by saying too many things that weren't true. The flat tire is true, but everything else is a feeling. And unfortunately, feelings are not facts. Mm. Okay, so we have to separate feeling from fact. I feel like a loser. That's not a fact. I am a loser. That's not a fact. It's a feeling that you're packaging as a fact. So when we can separate the lies from the feelings and we can say, okay, what's the actual event? In all honesty, what's the event? We have to catch it. And then we have to challenge it and say, okay, it might... Am I a loser or am I just frustrated at the situation right now? It, am I destined to be a failure or is are times really tough right now? And I, need, I just need to think about a different strategy. Once we challenge it, we can start to change it. And it takes consistency, uh, conditioning and practice to get better at these kind of things. But when we change it, we can say, okay, the situation is really tough right now. I lost my job. That's real. I am not a loser because I lost my job, but I did lose my job. That's not going to be like this forever. On a daily basis, what can I do? I can apply to 10 jobs a day. That's 300 jobs a month. That's 600 jobs every two months. That's, that's what I can do actively. Can I do 11 jobs a day, 12 jobs a day? What can I do with where I'm at right now to make this a little bit better or what can I do right now to make this suck a little bit less? You know, you can either make it better or make it not worse. And we always have that choice.
Mm, I love that. And thanks for sharing the triangle. It's really easier to remember it this way, right? Catch, challenge, and change. Yeah, I love that. It's about catching yourself, right? Self-awareness, right? You have to become aware of your own self-talk. So then challenge it, right? Your limiting beliefs, you know, your self-talk, your negative self-talk, and then change. What can you do about it? So yeah, I mean, thanks for sharing that. It's really helpful. Um, you know, like, like we all have, you know, we still have, I do have self-talk, um, I mean, negative self-talk. We still feel like imposter sometimes. We right? all do. We all do. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Right. So what would you, what advice would you give to, so because I know my listeners, they are some of them, not all of them, but I know because I talk to some of them, I know they are listening to my podcast as um they're struggling with confidence you know like self-worth um so what advice would you give to people who are struggling because you i believe you will be the best person to talk about this what advice would you give to people today who are struggling with self-worth self-acceptance you know um and hiding their true self whether it's from their family from their friends society what advice would you give to them well you, have you ever heard the phrase uh communication is key a lot of people will say communication is key. Communication is so important. It is, but that's the second step because self-communication is the most important. If mm -hmm. you can't communicate effectively with yourself, how can we ever expect to communicate effectively with other people? No, no one will recognize your confidence until you do. And confidence, I think we we think about it like some sort of amazing place that's so hard to get to and that once you feel it it's unwavering and amazing and never leaving that's not how confidence is confidence is a choice in the moment it's not a a huge finish line of a race and let's be honest there is no finish line to mental health there's no finish line to success there's no finish line to confidence right. confidence is a choice in the moment right now so give yourself proof that you're confident. Give yourself undying proof that you're confident. When you make goals or you make a, a you say you're going to do something for yourself and you make it a non-negotiable, do it. Even if it's one small thing, go to the gym one time a week. Mm. Wake up at 9 a.m. instead of 10 a.m. Make yourself three meals a day instead of two meals a day. Don't negotiate with yourself. Give yourself confidence in that I, I do what I say I'm going to do and I can do it, even if it's the smallest task, because small tasks over time that you accomplish lead to bigger and bigger, bigger tasks. And that's more proof that you're confident. It's more proof that you're willing and capable and able. But if you don't give yourself the chance to, to exceed or excel at something that you said you were going to do, how can you ever be confident? It's similar to strength. You only know you're strong once you've tested your strength. You only know you're confident once you've given yourself reasons to be confident. Otherwise, mm -hmm. that's just ignorance. If you just believe you're confident and you never gave yourself reasons to be confident, that might just be ignorance or arrogance. Right. Confidence is a choice. It's a choice to do the stuff that you were kind of afraid to do, but you did it anyways. Yeah. One single choice repeated over time can be a completely different life. Yeah, but yeah, that's so true. I totally agree 100%. But it's all about the first step. It's always the hardest, right? How do you encourage people or motivate people? Because there's so many and it's frustrating when I see people, they say they want to do like, this is what they want to do. For example, maybe it's starting a podcast. They tell me, I want to start a podcast. You want to be like you, you know, but they don't do it. But they keep saying that, you know, like I want to do this. I want to do this, but they are not doing it. They are not taking the first step. So yeah, I mean... What would you say to these people who are just like procrastinating, you know, and yeah, yeah, just too afraid. Yeah. So there's a few elements here. Some people are perfectionists. They say it needs to be perfect. It needs to be amazing, you know. But the way I look at perfectionism is perfectionism is just procrastination laced in gold. Oh, yeah. You know? yeah. So perfectionism is a way to procrastinate enough that you can't fail if you don't try. Mm. So that, that philosophy keeps people feeling safe. Oh, if I never actually do it, I'll never actually fail at it. And it's a safety mechanism. It's a protective mechanism, you know? When we talk about, oh, you just have to take the first step. I think every step is a choice and it's not necessarily harder. It's only, the first step is harder because we don't have clarity in exactly what the first step is. Right. If you wanted to start a podcast, of course that sounds amazing, but everyone wants to cross the finish line without running the race. 
the question is the the race doesn't start when you when the when the gun goes off and you start running the race starts six months before when you're training for it yeah you know so if you wanted to start a podcast okay what do you want to speak on what are you an authority in okay let's say you have your topic all right what are six to eight different topics that you would want to talk about write those down once you have those topics, what would you talk about in each of those? Great. You have that? Perfect. Do you have equipment? No? Okay, let's start with the phone. Fine. Let's record one episode on one of those topics that you recorded and commit to putting it out there, even if it's not perfect, because it won't be. Yeah. No one was ever perfect when they first started. No one. The, the best in the world were willing to look dumb at some point in their career or their life so that they could get really good. And- mm. What I love about this is perfect is the enemy of good and good is the start to anything great. I love that. Oh my God. If you're waiting to be perfect, you're going to be waiting forever. 10 years are going to go by and you're going to say, I wish I would have started that podcast sooner. I wish I would have started the gym sooner. I wish I would have taken control of my relationship or my marriage sooner. Mm -hmm. I wish I would have com communicated more. All of those things you you can start doing right now. You know, there, there's nothing stopping you from doing step one now. Identify what step one actually is, even if it's the smallest step in the world, and take it and congratulate yourself for that. Accumulate the wins, accumulate the success, because that will give you the confidence to take the next step. I'm not, can, I'm not, honestly, I don't care that you start a podcast. I care that you start a step. Yeah. And then I care that you take another step. I just want you to take one step and then another step after that. Whether you're running a marathon or mm -hmm. you're running down the street, both of them involve one step repeated over time, regardless of the distance, regardless of the distance. So that's all you need to do. Don't worry about the finish line. Worry about your own two feet right now and take the first step and just repeat that process. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. Now that it reminded me, so I want to go back to your story, if you don't mind. Um, what was the first step that you have taken personally to start being real, right? And, you know, basically, I think I watched a video of yours. Uh, I think it was your speaker reel that talked about um, how you started renegotiate with yourself. I, I remember that word because it's so powerful. So talk to me about that. Like, what was the first step, if you remember, if there was a first step that you have taken um, to start sharing your story, maybe publicly, or just like, you know, what was the first step? I think it started in fitness first, because I started sharing how I adapt to machines and lifting weights. I had to build a hook for my disability, you know, two fingers on my left hand and shorter left arm. I had to build a hook that goes around my wrist so I could lift weights. And in sharing that, I didn't think, I just thought it was like, oh, this might be good information. And I'm kind of sharing my story authentically. Maybe the first step for me was choosing to be authentic and choosing, even though I was uncomfortable, yeah. to share my true self and my true story, like to to share the the vulnerable moments where I'm not the strongest in the world right now. I'm not, you know, perfect, but this is what I'm doing. This is where I'm at. And this is who I am right now. That gave me room. It gave me a platform on social media, which is great, but it gave me room to say, oh, people don't need perfect. They just want real. Yeah. Yes. People want authenticity. Yeah. They don't want perfection. We're the ones who want perfection, but we tell ourselves we know what everyone else wants and we say they need us to be perfect. No, 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 no. They don't need that. They've never said that. And there's no way you could know that. You don't yeah. know what other people think. Yes. And let's be honest, what other people think of you is not your business. <laughs> yes, I it's love not. That. It's not. It's I not do. your business. You know, so uh, that first step for me in the gym was showing that the first step for me for speaking was I got invited to speak at a diabetes nonprofit from a buddy of mine. And I had never spoken before, but the idea was always cool. Mm. The I, I've always been a performer. You know, I loved I did dance. I did martial oh. arts. I did I played drums. You know, I did all kinds oh. of like stuff. I loved being on stages for some reason, but I didn't really like crowds. Okay. So, I perform, but I would never want to be in the crowd, you know, I, oh. it kind of was like that isolation feeling, which was nice. And I liked impacting people. But um, when I did my first speaking event, 
everyone, you know, they thought it was great or well, that's what they told me, but I knew I could do better. Yeah. So it was like an accomplishment, but I was like, I'm taking that as a challenge. And imagine for anyone listening, if anytime something either messed up or didn't go perfectly, instead of saying that sucked, we said, I'm taking this as a challenge to do better next time. What happens if we took everything as a challenge to do better instead of as a, oh, I'm, I'm done, I'm over it, as a, a quitting, you know, mentality? What happens if you just challenge yourself? Every time something hard happens, you're like, all right, this is a challenge that I'm going to find a way through. This is an obstacle that I'm going to find a way through. What happens if we took that mentality? You know, what? how much differently would your life be if you looked at life and all the hardships as an obstacle course race rather than as something to quit and stop? I love that. Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to start using that to myself, you know, because to be honest, every time when something hard or something that I did, I make a mistake. My first reaction um, is to beat myself up. You suck. Right? It's you are, yeah, yeah, it's, it's easy, easy, right? Yeah. Yeah. So I'm going to start um, using that. So thank you so much for sharing. Now, um, so how did, how did you feel um, when you, when you shared your story, you know, and it went viral, whether it's on social media, on the stage, in front of people, how, how did it make you feel? It was definitely a mixture. So I hid my hand for so long and I, I said, if I ever got a prosthetic arm, I would stop hiding my hand because, you know, in the United States, it's very tough to get medical coverage for something like that. Um, and I got coverage for it finally. So I made that non-negotiable deal with myself. So I said, okay, I'm going to make a video showing my hand and talking about this on YouTube. And at the time, my partner, that was the first time they had ever seen my hand after four years of being together, you know? Wow. Okay. I posted that video and I woke up to millions and millions and millions of views on YouTube. It's crazy. And it was all over Reddit and YouTube. It was absolutely crazy. And I was like, wow, okay. That was like jumping in the deep end, you know, like just jumping. And it was the best thing that ever happened because by putting myself out there and being authentic, like I had done years yeah. before. I received so much, not just support, but I realized I wasn't alone. And so many people were just like me. I think that's why we struggle. We think we're unique in our struggles. We think our, we're alone on this island of like obstacles and hurt and that no one understands. So many people understand. They don't understand your specific life because that's unique to you. But we understand hiding and hurting and hoping and wishing that we had more and feeling broken. So many people understand that. And for so long, I isolated myself to think no one could understand me mm. when hundreds, if not thousands of people did, you know, and it made me feel better to know like, okay, if other people can do it, so can I, you know, if other people have gone through this and they're going through this, maybe we can do this together. Maybe, maybe there's a way. Mm. And that just gave room, me being authentic, not perfect, gave room to build on that and it gave me reasons to keep going right yeah is that how your career started like so you become a social media influencer you know motivational speaker and people started inviting and becoming on the stage um uh, sorry on a tv show is that how then it led you to all these opportunities because of that first video so so i had built my social media years before still okay. st still building while i was hiding my hand even if you go through my Instagram now, if you go back far enough, you'll see where I'm still hiding my hand. Mm. Um, so I had already built my following pretty high once I released that video and it grew more because of that video. And then probably a month after that video, that's when I got reached out to by The Rock's team mm. to be on the show Titan Games. So it led to more opportunities, but I had already built a platform, which was great. So regardless of the TV show and all the other media I've done, all the magazines and stuff, I had my brand that I built and my brand was built on authenticity. Beautiful. Yeah. Awesome. So, all right. Now the, the next thing I want to talk to you about is about your book, because now you are not just a speaker. You are not just an um, influencer. You are everything. You have a, a book now and it's called The Upper Hand. Um, so what was your, why did you write a book? I mean, because um, I'm asking it as a, you know, it's a selfish question because I'm writing my book. So I want to know like, what was your inspiration of awesome. writing the book? Yeah. Absolutely. So I have my book, The Upper Hand, that's been out for about two years now. And then I have another book coming out this September wow. with a huge publisher. So I'm in my 
second phase of releasing I'm on my first book. And for me, that was um, all about internal communication. I wanted to help people have better conversations internally because that that first book laid the groundwork for what I'm doing now and what this new book is about language hmm. and understanding that the internal narratives and internal dialogues affect every part of our lives. And we're all looking for help. We we think maybe we need more money. Maybe we need better relationships. Maybe we need a better body. We, we're going outward for things and not inward. And it's kind of like the fuel that you put in your car. If you put bad fuel in your car, you can't expect to go far. So I wanted to help people change the conversation, change the story, and give people concepts for better internal communication that led to better quality of life on the outside. How do you define it? Because you keep saying the word, the quality of life. How do you define it? Like <clears throat> what the quality of life means to you? So um, I used to say success all the time, and I don't really like that word because it has a negative connotation sometimes, like a lot of money, a lot of whatever. Yeah. Quality of life to me means feeling contentment and feeling like you're not forced to do everything and you're just living a repetitive life where you just don't like anything. You're not happy, but you're not sad. You're yeah. just in this purgatory state of like, I wish it was better, but it's not bad enough to change. Yeah. Quality of life to me is waking up and feeling like I can do this today and going to sleep like this is this is good. This is good. It's enough. And I truly believe nothing is enough for the person who doesn't currently have enough. OK, quality of life is everything for me. It's I think that's the true pursuit of life is finding quality in moments. And if you can't find quality in moments now, more than likely, you're not going to find quality in moments later. So that's something we can start doing now in the process of finding more quality of life as we go. I think you should definitely write a third book on quality of life. That's It's what I speak about a lot. And it's funny you know, that you're, the, know, you're like third or fourth person to say that. And it's the reason why I asked the question, because like you said, you know, success is so over, overly used, right? It's overrated. You know, fulfillment, being happy, you know, um, with yourself, you know, with your life, passion. That's that's what I strive for as well. What is your daily routine? Like, do you have a fixed routine? Like, I'm going to work on my mindset. Like, how do you always grow? Because I'm a big believer of, um, you know, I'm a big fan of personal development, growth mindset. So what do you do every day to keep yourself not just physically strong, but also mentally strong? Also, like, keep growing yourself, keep becoming better speaker, author, you know, um husband and like friend right so what is your daily routine so I don't have a, a hardcore routine but what I do on a daily basis is I work on different parts of my business and myself so I the gym is like a five to six day a week thing um my thing health wealth relationships you know the three core pillars of anyone's life um I'm constantly improving the way I speak whether that's through intentional research of how to improve storytelling or how to improve the actual voice and the art of speaking. Right. Uh, I also coach speakers to build businesses. So that helps me refine not only my speaking ability, but my coaching and teaching ability. So helping speakers who are great storytellers or want to improve their storytelling, add money to their speaking business. That is something I wish I had when I started speaking, you know, mm. so I get to be the mentor that I never really had, which is incredible. Yeah, I've found ways to get better through doing and that I'm constantly speaking, whether it's on a podcast or on a stage or to people. And I love being able to have these intimate, authentic conversations, because that is what keeps me going that it kind of drives me to just put myself out there constantly. I give myself a chance to be as real as I can be constantly. And that that is my routine, I would guess I would say, is be as authentic as possible, as much as possible, so that you see it's enough, you're worth it, and you don't need anything more. There's nothing more you need than to be fully and authentically yourself. And why do you think so many people are so afraid to become, to be their authentic self, you know? So I, I talk about that in my new book. Uh, it's called The mm -hmm. Art of Changing Course. Language. Language keeps us stuck. And the best way I can explain that is, uh, I'll ask you right now, are you a morning person or a night person? A night person. 
perfect. So that's not true. And here's why. Okay. You're not a night person. You just have a habit of going to sleep later. Okay. If you wanted to become a morning person, you could just have a habit of waking up earlier. It's not who you are. It's what you choose to do. Mm. I'm not a gym person. I just have a habit of going to the gym. I wasn't always a gym person. You know, yeah. I wasn't born a gym person. If we can change our habits to change our identity, then think about this. When you say, I'm not good enough, or I, I can't show my true self, that's not true. You haven't shown your true self in the past, but it doesn't mean you can't moving forward. Mm. You don't have to be who you always were. At any point, you can choose to change by choose to be the habits that you wish to be. Easier said than done, absolutely, but better done than said anyways. No yeah. one wants to get up and go to work, but they say that they have to. You don't have to. You could be homeless. But if you choose to not be homeless, you can choose to start making the habits that create the life that you want. I'm not saying you can't choose to be a millionaire. I'm not saying that. But I'm saying you can choose to be like, oh, I don't feel confident right now, but I'm going to be myself anyways. I don't feel like everyone cares about what I'm doing, but it doesn't matter because their feelings are not my business. Mm -hmm. You can always choose to, to instill the habit in the moment. We're, we're given constant momentary choices and we make choices. But if we tell ourselves bad stories, like I can't do this, I can't do that. No one will accept. If we tell ourselves those kind of stories and we operate based on that information, we're operating based on faulty information. So at the end of the day, it takes constant choices to recognize I can be my true self whenever I choose to be, not whenever I want, because that's a feeling, whenever I choose to be. And if you choose to be yourself more often than not, you'll find the fulfillment comes. But if you choose to not be yourself and blame it on something else, both were a choice. One just happened to benefit you a lot more. Yeah. I love that. It's, we all have a choice. Like every single moment, we all have a choice, right? Every moment. Every yes, moment. I love that. Yeah, I can't wait for your book to be out in September. Is that right? Um, did you Thank say you. September? I appreciate that. Right, okay. Yeah, yeah. it releases September 4th. Oh. So I'm, I'm super excited on this one. It's like my biggest book yet. And it's really, it's the art of changing course. It's about getting unstuck and solving the real problems. So it's a super unique process on helping people change not only the internal language, but creating self-accountability and outward accountability and becoming a mentor to improve your own life. And we don't think about that often, but it, I ask people, when did you decide to become a mentor? And a lot of people are like, oh, I've never decided to be a mentor. You decided to become a mentor the day you were born because people look at you and they see what you do. They mm -hmm. see your choices and your decisions. And regardless of whether you're trying to inspire you are teaching people subconsciously or consciously how to act and react. So whether that's friends, family, kids, peers, anyone, they see you and they either say, oh, that's how I should act or, oh, that's how I shouldn't act. Mm -hmm. You are a mentor to people and you don't even know it. But how differently would you start to act if you knew people look to you for what you do? Yeah. It is the, the current way you're leading your life a mentor that you would want to be? And if not, why don't we start? Yeah, well, I love that. Before you lead anyone, you have to, the person you should lead is yourself, right? We have to lead ourselves first before Absolutely. We lead anyone, right? So yeah, and I love that, yeah, because we all, we have to learn how to coach ourselves. Maybe you don't have a coach and I believe we all should have, right? A coach, yeah, um, someone, you know, yeah. So if you don't have, for whatever reason, maybe you can't afford a coach, you have to learn how to coach yourself and how can you do it? by listening to podcasts, by reading your book, right? And there's so many resources out there, Um, but I just have to... You get to, you get to. You get to, you, you know, inspire you yourself, to. improve. You have yeah. the opportunity to. Yeah. You know, you're giving an opportunity by having this podcast and people, I hope they appreciate like, what you're truly doing and in speaking and writing all of that. There's so many resources that are available, but here's, here's a free one for you and you can use this for anything. Mm -hmm. Is this thought or action going to help me or hurt me? Use that. Just use that simple filter in everything you do. You're about to go to the gym or not go to the gym. You're about to go to work or not go to work. You're about to start an argument or not start an argument. Is what I'm about to do going to help me or hurt me? If right. you can be honest with yourself to answer that one question, 
that guiding principle will help you make much better decisions, which will lead inevitably to a much better life, more quality of life, at least. So start with something simple. You don't need a fancy coach. You don't need fancy camera. You don't need, <laughs> you need better stories and better language to start making better decisions that lead to better quality of life. Love that 100%. Now, thank you so much for coming again. Um, We want to have you back when you have released your second book, definitely. I would love that. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, we'd love to talk about that. So, but before we end, we always end with our final five rapid fire questions. So every question has to be answered Great. either one word or one sentence maximum. Perfect. All right. Okay, first question is, what is one thing you wish you knew earlier? I wish I knew that it was okay to be myself. Second question, if you could live your life all over again, what would you do differently? I would have started speaking much sooner and learning that storytelling is a career. What is something you're trying to learn or curious about right now? I'm trying to learn more on specific kinds of philosophy because I love going deeper in thought and figuring out what are what is the true truths and honesty in the world, you know? Hmm. That is really interesting, okay. Yeah. If you have five minutes and the whole world is listening to you, what would you say? I would teach people that it's okay to make mistakes and mistakes don't equal a bad future. It's okay to be yourself. There's a beautiful message. I'm sure you'll get to speak to the world one day. The last question is, what brings you the greatest joy? Animals. <laughs> <laughs> I love animals. Animals are it's between it's between animals and impact. Being able to see people. I don't like just making a, a change for people. I like seeing the light bulb go on and they make the change for themselves. So seeing impact in other people's lives really just does something for me. You just make me want to ask another question, which is not part of the question, but who That's was okay. the biggest who has the biggest impact in your life? It's always been kids. So that one kid from that story that I told in the oh. beginning of this podcast, it's always been kids and it's never been people who are rich or famous. Seeing kids have those moments where they find quality or value or they just live their lives unguarded and unbothered. Um, I've always seen that as like, almost I wish I had that life when I was growing up. So when I see them do it, it just makes me like, this is why I want to do it, you know, to create more adults that create more kids that feel good about their life and good about any situation, whether they were born with a disability or not, whether they were born different or not, high income, low income, it doesn't matter. Kids who can find happiness and contentment and quality of life, that to me is just so meaningful. Mm. So thank you so much again for being such an inspiration for me and my listeners today, showing us that we can truly live a limitless life. So now tell my people where you want them to find you, if they want to, um, you know, where is the best place um, for them to follow you on social media or is it a website? How do they get your book? Tell them about it. So everything is, all my social medias are just at my name, Chris Rudin, and my website is chrisrudin.com. My book is currently available for pre-order, The Art of Changing Course on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, Books A Million. Um, we have another month to go for this uh, book launch. So it, depending on when this episode comes out, whether it's in pre-order or fully out, any support means a lot to me. And the first few hundred orders will have access to private groups with me and private coaching. So um, feel free to support if you're open to it. But if not, I put out so much content on my social medias with podcasts like this as well. Use the resources available to you to find your own quality of life because it's there. It's there in the messaging, in the language, and in the, the daily process of just being authentic. So uh, I hope that this helped at least one person out there. And if it did, I'm I'm doing my job. Yeah, definitely one person. That's me, right? That's me. So yeah, that's great. That's great. There we go. <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. Thank you so much. Um, again, I'm learning so much from you. You know, um, and that's why I love podcasting so much. Um, yes, this episode will be out really, really soon. And guys, I know you love this episode because you're listening to the very end. So tell me, you know, as always, take a screenshot of this if you're listening. Share it on social media, IG. Just take me and tag Chris um in the story and tell us what is your biggest takeaway. I would love to hear and connect with you and please follow Chris you know go to his website buy the book 
his upper hand, the first book and the second book. So buy all the books and make sure you visit the show notes yes. below. Buy <laughs> all the links. And remember to like and subscribe and leave us a review if you haven't already. Now, I will always leave you the same way as I leave you every other episode. Show up. The world needs you and you need you. Thanks for listening and I wish you all a joyful and amazing day ahead. Thank you again for tuning into Find Joy Joanne podcast. If you enjoyed today's episode, take a screenshot and share it on your IG story and take Find Joy Joanne underscore podcast so I know you are listening. And leave us a positive review on Apple Podcasts if you haven't already done so. And remember to hit the subscribe button whether you are listening on Spotify, iTunes, Amazon Music or any of your other favorite platforms. If you love what we are doing and want to become one of our sponsors, you can send me a DM to connect. And thanks for being here. I will see you soon in the next episode.